Welcome to the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Tonight is our eighth study of the series of 24 amazing lessons from the Word of God. And our study is entitled, A Colossal City in Space. We will begin with the stories recorded in 1 Kings chapters 3 and 10. After Solomon was established as the new king of Israel, the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Ask, what shall I give thee? 1 Kings 3, 5. The young king could have requested money, fame, or long life, but he didn't. Instead, he asked for wisdom to justly govern God's people. In answer to that humble and heartfelt prayer, the Lord gave Solomon tremendous wisdom and perception, surpassing every other human being who preceded him and who followed him. On top of that, God also blessed him with fame, riches, and long life. During Solomon's reign, Israel enjoyed unparalleled peace and prosperity. Precious metals were so abundant in Jerusalem during his time that silver was considered as common as stone. 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 27 says, And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the whale for abundance. In addition to the magnificent temple of marble and gold that Solomon built for God, he also constructed a lavish palace and a courtyard plus entire cities to house his chariots and hotsmen. Splendid flowering gardens where rare trees graced every town. Monarchs, nobles, and royalty came from around the world to visit him and bring gifts as well. They longed to hear the profound wisdom that God had put in Solomon's heart. In 1 Kings 24, 10, 24, we read, And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom which God put in his heart. Now, among the many regal visitors who came was the queen of Sheba. She wanted to see firsthand if the reports of what Israel's king was true. The queen of Sheba, she tested Solomon with many hard questions and was stunned by his brilliant answers. Everywhere she looked, her senses were dazzled. But dear friends, even Israel at its zenith was nothing compared to the glorious kingdom God has prepared for you. Let's go to our first question. What did Jesus promise his people? The Bible says, the master himself said, 
In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. John 14 and verse 2. The good news is, God not only sent his son to be with us, but through his son, God wants us to be with him. Our father's house is amazingly big. And more than that, he has an amazing heart for you and me. And that is why Jesus has gone to prepare a place in our Father's house. We'll go to a second question. What do we know about this place Jesus is preparing? God said in Isaiah, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 65 verse 17. Apart from having a dwelling place, in our Father's house in heaven, God has promised to recreate this new earth so that His children can have this place as well. In the book of Hebrews, we read, For He hath prepared for them a city. Hebrews eleven sixteen. Our Father's house is called a city. It is the capital city of the universe. Even on earth, the rulers live in cities, don't they? So also, the ruler of the universe lives in the best city. God rules numberless worlds from his city above, and we will be part of that ruling when we go there. The Time magazine had a cover page with this question, Does heaven exist? because people cannot see where heaven is. Also, with their scientific advances, they cannot detect if there is one. Many intellectual minds have denied the existence of God and of heaven as well. But we look not for these answers in the books and articles of man's knowledge, but we look for answers from the Word of God, which contains the truth of all things. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5 and verse 5. God has prepared for His people new heavens and a new earth He will prepare. And He has prepared a holy city. The righteous will inherit the glorious mansions built by Jesus, plus a fabulous country home in the new earth. We are going to build there our own houses as revealed in the book of Isaiah. It is written, and they shall build houses and inhabit them, Isaiah 65, 21. Billionaire investor Jeff Green was selling his 25-acre compound and magnificent royal house in Beverly Hills, California, with an asking price of US dollars 195 million. It is the nation's richest private residence. But our houses in heaven, beloved, will be much more incredible than any earthly home. Let's go to our next question. What more do we know about the holy city? John wrote in the book of Revelation, And the city lieth four square, and he measured the city with the reed. Revelation 21 and verse 16. The city is four square. And then it says 12,000 furlongs. 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Revelation 21, 16. The length and breadth and height are equal. It says it's four square, which means it's a cube. It has three dimensions. The length, breadth, and the height of the city are same. It is said to be 12,000 furlongs in circumference. So four sides would equal 12,000 furlongs. One furlong is one-eighth of a mile. 
So 12,000 furlongs would be 1,500 miles. If we had to convert it into kilometers, it would be 2,400 plus kilometers. So four sides equals approximately 2,400 kilometers. Therefore, each side would be roughly 600 kilometers. Now remember, the length, breadth, and height are equal, John said. So the city would not just be 600 kilometers in length and breadth, but also in height as well. Can you imagine a city that is a skyscraper towering more than 600 kilometers into the sky? Indeed, it is a colossal city. Well, beloved, there is much place there for all of God's people. This city is going to come down to planet Earth later when God recreates this Earth. John wrote, And I saw that, that holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Revelation 21 and verse 2. And again, John wrote, The holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, had a wall great and high, and had 12 gates, Revelation 21, 10 and 12. It is going to land on planet Earth, and we are told it's going to land in the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, according to Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. And Revelation 21, 17 tells us about the height of the wall. It says he measured the wall thereof and 140 and four cubits. A cubit is 18 inches, so 144 cubits would, would be 216 feet. That was the height, and probably the thickness of the wall as well, because everything seems to be a perfect square in heaven. The wall had 12 gates, and 12 angels were stationed at the gates to welcome God's children in. What was the wall made up of? John wrote, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, Revelation 21 and verse 18. Jasper is a transparent, see-through stone like glass. So those who are inside the city can see everything that is happening outside. And those who are outside in the new earth can see the things happening inside. Are there streets in heaven? And what are they made up of? Let's see what John saw. He wrote, The street of the city was of pure gold, Revelation 21 and verse 21. Every city on earth has streets for the vehicles to ply. Why do we need streets in the heavenly city? Are there vehicles there? Well, remember when Elijah was translated to heaven, the Bible tells us how he was taken up. We are told that he was driven by horses and chariots of fire. Second Kings 2 Kings 2.11 records, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and part of them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Angels drive those chariots. These are heavenly horses of fire and chariots of fire. On another occasion, when the Syrian army came to attack Israel during prophet Elisha's time, the servant of the prophet alerted the prophet about it. And the prophet Elisha told him that God's army is on their side. Then the Bible says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, round about Elisha, 2 Kings 6, 17. So, on the heavenly streets of gold, 
the angels of God ride the horses and chariots of fire inside the city of God and also to travel to the other worlds with it. Remember when God came down on Mount Sinai, he didn't come alone. He came with the angels of glory. And we are told in scripture, in Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. The angels, yes, they have wings to fly, but they could also use these chariots and horses to transport themselves wherever they want. And when we go to heaven, we can zoom through the golden streets on these chariots and horses of fire. We'll go to our next question. What does the Bible say about the city's water and food supply? John wrote, He showed me a pure river of water of life. Revelation 22 and verse 1. The river of life springs from the throne of God. This is going to be the tastiest water and the healthiest drink ever. It will be so invigorating that life will sparkle as we drink it. John also saw the tree of life near the water of life. He wrote, on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare 12 manner of fruits, Revelation 22 and verse 2. And then he continues, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, Revelation 22 and verse 2. An inexhaustible, pure river of water flows from the throne of God, and then there is the tree of life which yields different fruits, every month a different kind. This fabulous fruit and its leaves provide the antidote of death and perpetuates eternal life. In addition, God's saints will raise their own food at their country homes in the new earth. Isaiah 65, 21 says, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. The diet of God's people will be what it was before sin entered the world. Fruits and grains and nuts. You can see that in Genesis 1, 29 and 31. And there will be much more than that. The taste will be incredibly delicious and the nutritional value will be perfect. Remember, because of sin, our taste buds are corrupted. But in heaven, we will be restored every bit and also the fruits and other delicacies will be so amazing to taste. The baobab tree is found in Africa, in Australia, and Madagascar. This alien looking baobab tree is sometimes known as the tree of life. It provides shelter, clothing, food, and water for both man and animal. This disproportionately fat trunks, they store thousands of gallons of water in the spongy fibrous wood during the rainy season, which it then uses during the subsequent dry period. This fruit of this tree is also called the monkey bread. It has more vitamin C than four oranges. The pollen can be used as glue the seeds are rich in protein, calcium, oil, and phosphates. Young leaves can be used as spinach and have high calcium contents. The fibrous trunk can be woven into rope, cloth, mats, and paper, and the bark sometimes is used to make tea. Many of the mature trees are usually hollow, providing living space for animals and humans. In addition, many of the Babao trees 
seem to be very ancient, but just how old is much disputed. One old tree in South Africa is 72 inches thick and 155 inches in circumference. It is said to have been carbon dated at nearly 6,000 years old. You know, the Bible says about the 6,000 years that there was a tree of life here on planet Earth. Of course, it is not this tree that was there. The tree of life has 12 manners of fruit and it yields a new fruit every month. Thus, one year, the cycle is completed with the 12 different fruits. Let's go to our next question. How will living in heaven be different than living here on earth? The scripture tells us in the book of Isaiah, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, Isaiah 35 and verse 5. There will be no more physically or spiritually blind people there. And then Isaiah wrote, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, verse 5. All would hear clearly every word that everyone speaks, especially what God speaks. Isaiah continues, Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, Isaiah 35 and verse 6. How wonderful it'll be for everyone to sing and praise the Lord. Isaiah also wrote, They shall not hurt nor destroy, Isaiah 65, 25. BLT is the only bear, lion, and tiger combo living in the same enclosure in the world. Balu, Leo, and Shere Khan were found in a drug dealer's basement in Atlanta during a police bust, where they had been abused and kept in wild conditions. They were just cubs then, and destined for a grim future when a police raid in the house saved them from the abject state they were living in. This was in 2001. Ever since, they were taken into Noah's Ark and they spent their days and nights together, playing together, sleeping as a pod and even grooming each other. They rarely fight. And when they do, it's like children, never ever violent, but it's like brothers that quarrel. They are now happily living their lives and will do so here until their natural death. But in the new earth, there will be perfect harmony, not just with these animals, but with every animal. How wonderful it will be to see the wild and the mild in perfect union. Isaiah wrote, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and a little child shall lead them. Isaiah 11 and verse 6. And in that passage of Isaiah, there is more to it as well. It says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the crocodile's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, 6 to 9. How wonderful it'll be to see the wild and the mild, one big family. The natures will be completely changed. Even little children will be safe to play around these majestic beasts. I'm waiting for that day. 
Isaiah also wrote, the desert shall blossom as the rose, Isaiah 35 and verse 1. There won't be barren land in the new earth as we have here today. It will be a carpet green all over the world with roses and lilies and all kinds of flowers that decorate the place. Our wildest imaginations cannot capture the beauties and the glories and the splendor that is waiting for each one of us. Will there be anybody falling sick in heaven and in the new earth? Let's see what the Bible says. Isaiah wrote, The inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. Isaiah 33 and verse 24. When Jesus comes, we are told there will be change of our bodies. In 1 Corinthians 15, 53, it says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. There will be no hospital in heaven or in the new earth, no patients, and of course, no doctors and nurses and the other parad paramedics. So we will not fall sick and we will not grow old or tired. John adds, there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Revelation 21 and verse 4. The wages of sin is death. When death, our last enemy, is destroyed at the second coming, all that comes with the package of sin and death is destroyed as well. For 6,000 years, this earth has been a place of death, sorrow, crying, pain. You know, every day around 150,000 people die around the world. But thank God that in heaven and in the new earth, death will never reappear. Would you like to know God's plan for our broken world as revealed in Bible prophecy? Want practical, trusted solutions for your biggest challenges? Encouraging and enlightening, Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides provide 27 Bible-based topical lessons with beautiful graphics and straightforward answers that are easy to understand. Each study guide leads you toward real, relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have healthier relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave your future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Available in English, Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu. Don't wait. Order your complete set of study guides today by visiting bookstore.aftv.in. Let's go to our next question. What kind of bodies will the saints have? The scripture tells us, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our wild body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Our bodies are going to be changed like Jesus' body. We shall have the resurrected body of our Lord. The apostle Paul wrote of the change of this present body. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 42 to 44, it is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. It will all happen at the twinkling of an eye when Jesus is going to blow the last trump. Our next question, is Jesus' body real or is he a spirit? Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Luke 24, 39. 
Jesus' body, after his resurrection, was real, with flesh and bones. You could touch him, you could feel him. The disciples thought he was a spirit initially, when he appeared suddenly while the doors were still closed. But after they felt him and they watched him eat, they knew he was real. You can see that in Luke 24, 40 to 43. 40 days later, Jesus led them out to Bethany and ascended to heaven. The angels who appeared to the disciples said, this same Jesus who had flesh and bones will so come in like manner as ye have seen him go to heaven. Acts 1 verse 11. Since his incarnation, Jesus is forever likened with a human race as well as being divine. Let's go to our next question. Question number eight. What other encouraging promise is found? Peter says, in Acts chapter 3, and he shall send Jesus Christ, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Acts 3, 20 and 21. Jesus is coming back, and all things will be restored as before sin entered the world, and much more, for he said, life will be more abundant. John also wrote, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Revelation 14 and verse 4. The Redeemer and the redeemed will be one. The shepherd and the sheep will be one. The potter and the clay will be one. Praise God. Every glorious thing that was lost by the entrance of sin will be restored in God's new kingdom, and God and man will be one. All people will genuinely love each other. They will trust and support each other. As a result, there will be no more violence, no more betrayal, no more abuse, disloyalty, dishonesty, backbiting, insecurity, depression, danger, disappointment, heartache, or anything. It will be a joyful, happy, contented, abundant living for eternity. We shall follow our master in the paths of righteousness. We will take our next question, number nine. Will sad or painful memories from this life trouble people in heaven? Isaiah 65 says, the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Isaiah 65, 17. In the previous verse, it specifies it more clearly. The former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. Isaiah 65, 16. The troubles will be forgotten. Also the phrase, it'll not come to mind, is better translated it will not move upon the heart. The Lord is promising that the sorrows of this earth, which brings pain right now, will not bring pain anymore for us for all eternity. Let's go to our question number 10. Will people from earth recognize each other in God's new kingdom? Let's see what the apostle said. Then shall I know, even as also I am known. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12. We will indeed recognize each other by our appearance, by our walk, by our mannerism, by our speech, and many other things. Our abilities to discern each other will be improved, in fact, in heaven. Heaven will be an utterly fantastic family reunion. Just think about this. If we cannot recognize our loved ones in heaven, and imagine you have prayed for your family and friends, and you don't recognize them there, and you will not know whether God has answered your prayer. Yes, beloved, the identity that is unique will be maintained for all eternity. We will recognize 
our friends and loved ones when we meet them. Our identity is eternal, but we will receive the finishing touch of the master artists and we will look much lovelier than we are now. With this body of eternal youth, we shall never grow old. Let's go to question number 11. What are the thrilling promises does God give us regarding his kingdom? The scripture tells us, the ransomed of the Lord shall come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy. Isaiah 35 and verse 10. The joy there is indescribable. It will be eternal as well. Nothing will steal our happiness in heaven. Songs of praise will continually flow from the lips of the redeemed to the creator. How beautiful it will be. David said, there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16 and verse 11. The pleasures of sin is for a season, but the pleasures of God are eternal. The pleasures of sin are deceptive and destructive, but the pleasures of God are true pleasures. A lot of surprises will be there that will thrill our souls. Will the young boys and girls have fun as well? The Bible says the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Zechariah 8 and verse 5. Dear young boys and young girls, do not miss this unending pleasures that are waiting just for you. And do not trade the fun of this world for the real fun that God has prepared for you. All our dreams will come true there. Isaiah also added, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Our tiredness will forever be gone. With beaming and streaming energies, we will be moving around. We could choose either to walk or run. Or, the prophet said, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. Isaiah 40, 31. Not just walk or run, but if you want to, you can spread your wings and fly like eagles. The saints will be able to fly with speed greater than light. Since they will inherit all things, we will for sure be visiting the innumerable worlds, taking just moments of time to reach there. According to scripture, God has made other worlds that are unfallen in sin. Paul wrote in Hebrews 11.3, through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. The word worlds is in plural meaning there are many other worlds. We'll go to our next question, number 12. Can we adequately describe God's new kingdom with words? What does the Bible say about that? The apostle wrote, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. Beloved, you and I, in our present state, can't even imagine the wonderful things God has prepared and planned for you and me. What we just see is just the peripheral. But when we go there, we will be startled to see the bliss of heaven. No matter what we suffer here on earth, when we go to heaven, it will outweigh all our trials. Paul said in Romans 8, 18, for I reckon that the present suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory 
which shall be revealed in us. All the humiliation, the pain and the anguish that we must endure will be forgotten when we look at the glories and the pleasures of that palace. Heaven will be cheap enough. All the redeemed saints will appreciate as never before the love of the Father and the Son. And songs of praise will burst forth from immortal tongues. He loved us. He gave his life for us. And with glorified bodies, with enlarged capacities, with hearts made pure, with lips undefiled, we shall sing the riches of redeeming love. There will be no more suffering once in heaven, no skeptics to whom we must labor to convince of the reality of eternal things, no prejudices to uproot, but all will be susceptible to that love which passeth all knowledge. Rest. Thank God. There is rest for the people of God where Jesus will lead the redeemed to green pastures by the streams of living waters which will make glad the city of God. Then the prayer of Jesus to the Father will be answered. I will that they also whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. What wonderful themes beyond our comprehension is waiting for all of us. Let's go to our next question. What is the highest reward of God's new kingdom? John wrote, God himself shall be with them. Revelation 21. And verse 3, believe it and stand in awe. God will actually live in the new earth with his people. Nothing can compare to the sheer delight and glory when God commanded the children of Israel to build a sanctuary. Remember what he told them and the purpose of it? He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Exodus 25, 25, verse 8. God came to dwell with them in the sanctuary, but he was hidden behind the veil of the temple where no one could see him except the high priest once a year with fear and trembling. He saw the covered glory of God within the cloud. And 2,000 years back, Jesus came as Emmanuel, God with us. And again, his glory was hid be beneath the human flesh. But now for eternity, God and man will dwell together face to face with God my Savior. We shall see him as he is, the Bible says. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What joy, what unending joy it is to see the Holy One of Israel. Even angels wail their faces and they praise God saying, holy, holy, holy. You and I will be able to see him face to face. Let's go to our next question. What will exclude people from God's heavenly kingdom? John wrote, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Revelation 21, 27. Sin defiles. Sin started in heaven with Lucifer, and he defiled the holy place along with one-third of heaven's angels that joined in his rebellion. Sinners will not enter there, for sinners and sin defile the place. God says, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. Revelation 21, verse 7. God has made abundant provisions for each one of us to overcome our sins, our weakness, our inherited and cultivated sins. 
by the blood of Jesus Christ. God's grace is sufficient for us. His divine strength is made perfect in human weakness. He says in the book of Isaiah, let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, 5. We can overcome by his grace and by his presence in our lives. Next question, what can I do about sin? The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. If I ask Jesus to forgive my sins, he will forgive and he will cleanse me from sin and make me his child. What do we need to do is to acknowledge we are sinners. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we acknowledge and confess to God all our wrongs, he has promised in his word to forgive us and also to cleanse us. God just doesn't pardon our wrong acts, our wrong words and deeds and intentions. God also cleanses the very fountain and makes it pure and clean so that we can be new creatures in Christ Jesus. Question number 16. What did Jesus say is the formula for success in this life and in the next? Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. That is exactly what King Solomon did when God asked him, what do you want? His first thought was God and God's kingdom and his righteousness. In return, the blessings of the glorious kingdom followed. This will happen to us if we seek the kingdom of God first. Place God first in your life, dear friend. Place him first in your plans. Place him first in your decisions. Place him first in your work. And students, place him first in your studies. And married people, place him first in your relationship. Place him first in everything. Place him first, and then all things will be added unto us. When we place God first, you don't lose anything. Rather, you gain so much more because the Lord always returns handsomely. Remember the boy who gave five loaves and two fish? Did he get back just five and two? No, he ate so much and even got more than that. Jesus fed so many people with that miracle. Yes, and that bread that Jesus gave was much better than what he gave Jesus and the fish as well. The psalmist said, when you place God first as the shepherd of your life, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Also, you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you desire to be saved and cleansed from sin so that you can be assured a place in God's kingdom? I wish you would. Jesus has done everything for you and for me. And he has already gone and prepared a place for you. Do not disappoint him by not making it there. He has paid the price for you. It's absolutely free. Do not reject the offer of grace. You will be so thrilled to know that he has a plan for you 
and you will be extremely thrilled when you see that plan when Jesus comes. May we all prepare our hearts as he prepares a place for us in those mansions above. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus. We know heaven is not heaven without God. Heaven is not about the golden city. It's not about the golden streets. It's not about the pearly gates. It's about seeing God face to face. But you have promised to give us more than what we can even imagine or think. I pray that we all would desire to be there and we would prepare our hearts for the kingdom of glory, that colossal city in space. In Jesus' name, amen. can be more irresistible than a kitten. These guys might look cute now, but some of their ancestors have grown into man-eaters. We're here in a lion park in South Africa now where we can view these creatures in relative safety, but there's a reason they're known as the king of beasts. So what is it that people find so enchanting and frightening about lions? Is it their speed, their claws, their sharp teeth, or all of the above? might also be some of the stories about man-eating lions. Like in 1898, right here in Africa, they were building a bridge over the Savo River in Kenya, and two brother lions terrorized the construction process, eating 135 workers. Did you know lions are mentioned in the Bible over 100 times, and you can find them all the way from Genesis to Revelation. It's usually in reference to their ferocity and how dangerous they are. Of course, Samson killed a lion with his bare hands. David killed a lion. There are man-eating lions in the Bible. The way that they punished criminals was by throwing them in the lion's den. And early Christians were even fed to lions. But amazingly, as the Bible mentions not all lions are to be feared, there have been a few friendly lions in history. For example, in the 1950s, a couple, George and Margaret Westbow, who lived up at a ranch near Seattle, Washington, adopted an abandoned lion cub. They named it Little Tight because they felt sorry for it. But they discovered as they tried to feed her, she refused to eat any meat at all. They were concerned thinking there was no hope for this little lioness to survive and everybody told them the same because we know in the wild, lions survive in almost an entirely meat diet. Then someone showed the West Bows that verse in the Bible that talks about in heaven, the animals are vegetarians and the lion will eat straw like the ox. That encouraged them. And so they began to feed little Tyke a purely vegetarian diet. Not only did she survive, she thrived growing into a lion that was over 352 pounds and over 10 feet long. In fact, zoologists that examined little Tyke when she was full grown said they had never seen such a perfect specimen of a lioness in their life, a pure vegetarian. You know, when we hear incredible stories about that of little Tyke, it reminds us that God's original plan was to make a world of total peace. It describes it here in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 11, verse six, the wolf also will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child will lead them. Nothing is gonna hurt and destroy in the new heavens and the new earth that God is gonna create. Wouldn't you like to live in a kingdom where there's perfect peace, where there's no more death or killing or pain? God says that he wants you in that kingdom. The Lamb of God made it possible for you to have an encounter with the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Wouldn't you like to meet him today?
get enough amazing facts bible study you don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth filled programming visit the amazing facts india media library at aftv.in at aftv.in you can enjoy video presentations in multiple languages as well as uplifting material to read all free of charge 24 hours a day 7 days a week right from your computer or mobile device visit aftv.in today Did you know Amazing Facts also has a free Bible school that you can do from the comfort of your own home? It's 27 beautifully illustrated lessons that will aid you in your study of God's word, available in English, Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu. Sign up today for this free Bible study course by visiting biblestudy.aftv.in to enroll today. For more than 50 years, Amazing Facts has been boldly sharing Bible truth around the world in response to Jesus' commission to preach his gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Thank you for your prayers and support.